morning we have um, our Superstition Mountain Master Gardeners, their first Saturday presentation. Um, they're a great partner here at Boyce Thompson Arboretum. My name is Shelby Storms. I'm the public programs manager here. Um, the Master Gardeners have been partners with us for over 10 years, um, either supporting our plant sale um, and then these educational first Saturday programs that were instituted a number of years ago. So thank you both, Tim and Tom, excuse me, I combined Kim and Tom and said Tim. <laughs> um, <laughs> Tom and Kim for joining us this morning. Kim is the public education program chair for the Master Gardeners and Tom is a Master Gardener as well. So today they're presenting Pick Your Pollinator. Very Take cool. it away, thank you both. All right, I'm the one running the show. So let me get this started here. Here we go, slide mode, got it? Are we good? Yes. Okay, I want to get my chat going. Q&A. Oh, gosh. Oh, I got Q&A, but I don't have chat. I don't know if that's the same thing. I hope that's the same thing. Okay. Chat is has one um, speak icon where Q&A has two. Okay. You're looking at the bottom bar. I don't have it in the bottom bar. When I go into SlideShare, uh, I lose that. So, um, oh, here's chat. I got it. There we go. Got it. All righty. Ready to rock and roll. Okay. So welcome everybody. Um, Tom and I are so happy to have you and Shelby as well. Um, we are the Superstition Mountain Master Gardeners. There's chapters of the Mount Master Gardener program all over the United States and Canada. Um, they're usually divided up by a region or a county or, or something like that. And that's what hence our name, Superstition Mountain. We kind of represent and um, belong to this area around the Superstition Mountains. Um, we, uh, the Master Gardener program started in Washington State in 1974. So it's not that old. Um, I'm older than that. So <laughs> it's not that old, and, uh, but it's, it's grown exponentially ever since. It's a very, very popular program. So we're here to share um, per our mission. We do educational programs and projects throughout our community. That's how we stay a master gardener. That's how we earn our stripes basically. And um, we're gonna share with you today a theme that we've picked out for our educational program this year, which is pollinators and pick your pollinator. We thought we'd focus on some pollinators and, and, uh, and learn together about some of the plants and the things we can do to protect and um, encourage those pollinators here in Arizona. Um, like uh, Shelby said, Tom's been around the Master Gardener program. He's actually a mentor to all of us and we appreciate him being here. I became the public education program chair about a year ago and I love it, that's my thing. Um, my profession is instructional technology. So I love doing this and this is how I earn my stripes is doing stuff like this. And Shelby, you know, in the age of COVID approached us to do this virtual format and it's been very rewarding. So I just wanna thank you all for being here. Okay, here we go. Okay. So this little slide just kind of talks to the biodiverse layers of the Arizona desert. What, and what, what does that mean? So Tom and I just wanted to share with you some facts about the desert. First of all, you all know that animals help pollinate um, our plants. Um, the three animals that we're gonna focus on today are the native bees, hummers, and the butterflies, specifically the monarch that we enjoy here in Arizona. You may not be surprised to hear that we have quite a few of these pollinators. They pollinate our flowering plants. In fact, they contribute to a $19 billion exportable crop production in our country um, every year. So they are very, very beneficial to humans. Um, as, and we hope that we're as beneficial to them. And that's part of why we're doing this um, presentation today so that we can become beneficial. Um, native bees in the Southwest, that includes Arizona, Texas, New Mexico, and Oklahoma. Um, we have the highest wild bee diversity of any other area in the United States. And Tom's gonna elaborate on that. It's quite impressive. Native bees are the most prolific pollinators as you can imagine. Um, we are also in a migratory corridor along the um, south-north gradient. That means that we're right in the middle of a migratory path of both hummers and monarchs. 
and they follow this path every year going north um, south to north following the bloom times of the plants and then they reverse that pattern um, in the fall or the winter to come back down to their um, winter um, winter wintering areas down in Mexico and places like that. And we'll share more information about that. There are four major hummingbird species in the Southwest, in the United States, actually. They're the Rufus, Anna's, the Black-billed, and the Red Throat, the Ruby-throated. And we get them all. We see all of those. In fact, we have earned the title of a nectar corridor as well, not just a migratory, but we are a nectar corridor. We provide a lot of the nectar sources for these animals. In fact, Anna's hummingbird is a permanent resident here. And primarily because of our arid um, climate, that's the first layer of our, our, our biodiversity. We've got a lot of sunshine here. We've got um, precipitation, but limited, but providing that dry, arid environment for these animals encourages their nesting and their breeding and things like that. So we are actually um, pretty special with that regard. The monarchs in Arizona, um, they come through a corridor as well. And we are the primary provider of their nectar sources as they fly um, that the north south and the south north um, path that they follow. In addition, our mountain ranges, um, all of our vast open spaces, our arroyos and our washes and things, tried to show that here in the picture. All of those things contribute to our biodiversity. In fact, we have 4,000 species of native plants in Arizona. Hundreds of those are in the category of a tree, a shrub, or a ground cover. And then, of course, we have our succulents that we're showing here on the screen. And those are all very, very valuable to our bi biodiversity. In fact, some of our succulents are wonders of nature and they're protected by law. And I think you all know what I'm talking about. You know, our saguaro, you can't find them anywhere but in Arizona. So they're pretty special plants. Um, biodiversity just basically means that there's a variety of animal and plant life. And in fact, the desert has a lot of that. And I think Tom will agree and he'll probably elaborate on that even more later, but there's a lot of um, life in the desert people don't realize. In fact, I was reading as I was researching for this slide that 35% of the Earth's surface is, is an arid, dry climate like us. And in fact, the life that we have is equal to the life in an ocean. So you think about all the life in an ocean, deserts have a similar variety. So that's pretty impressive. Our topic today is our pollinators, like we said, and the um, unique relationship that they have together. And that relationship is called mutualism. Um, these eight plants and the pollinators and the plants in, in, that we're going to talk about today are com completely dependent on each other. And we hope you'll enjoy the presentation. We're going to share information and let's get started with Tom on his bees. Take it away, Tom. Um, okay, well, my name is Tom McDonald and I've actually been in this Master Gardener program for over 20 years. Yeah. And, and anyway, <laughs> that's a long time. Um, yeah. Can I have the next slide? Well, before we leave, this this is a presentation that a group that I'm part of, the Sonoran Desert uh, Native Bees, did for bees, and I've just uh, modified it for pollinators. But we are going to talk about the Sonoran Desert Native Bee Group here at the end. This slide demonstrates all the different kinds of pollinators. We've got moss, beetles, bats, birds, flies, bees are the big ones. There's even uh, several four-legged mammals that, that help with pollination. Um, next slide. So why are they important? Well, for one thing, one third of our food crops come have to be pollinated. And uh, some of these plants can certainly make seed and fruit without pollinators. Maybe they get lucky with the wind or something, but Plants that need pollinators that are pollinated by animal pollinators produce way more fruit. It's a, a better quality fruit. And if there were, there were no bees, we'd have no ice cream because alfalfa seed production is dependent upon uh, bee pollination. And I'm gonna to touch on that in a minute. Tomatoes, uh, uh, several decades ago, hydroponic tomatoes started to be a big thing and they discovered that they weren't getting pollinated because 
They were pollinated by bumblebees. So they first started trying to pollinate the uh, tomato plants with humans using electric toothbrushes. The reason they were using the toothbrushes is that the, the bees actually buzz the pollen out of the tomato plants. Well, that, that proved to be pretty ineffective cost-wise. So they ended up importing bumblebees from Europe just strictly to pollinate the tomato plants in the greenhouses. Next slide. Another pollinator is the alkali bee. Uh, this is an, a native bee and uh, the uh, aforementioned alfalfa seed growers rely on the alkali bee to pollinate their alfalfa plants. In fact, in the background on this slide, you can see the, the nesting uh, so sites of these bees and the, the alfalfa farmers in California are actually creating alkali flats, which is basically they're dumping salt on the ground and disking it in and wetting it down because that's the preferred nesting site for these bees. And they'll build these alkali flats next to their fields. Next site. Next slide. <laughs> Another uh, managed native bee that, that is being used for pollination is the blue orchard bee. This is an almond, uh, alf, uh, almond orchard behind uh, the bee here, and that's the blue orchard bee. So they've discovered, this, these farmers have discovered that they can increase their production, increase their profit by using native bees. Next slide. I put this slide up here to show the basic idea that everything is connected. This is a picture of an ironwood tree. And as you go around, you can see all the various interactions between animals, insects, plants, and the ironwood tree. They, they, it's, a, uh, it's a mutualistic relationship. Everybody gets some good out of this relationship. The, the, uh, there's a microhabitat created underneath that's 15 degrees cooler than everywhere else. The birds roost in the trees and they, you know, birds, what do they do? They poop they, and that drops down below. It's underneath the canopy, all the leaves and debris falls down there. It cools us and enriches the soil. And there are thousands of different living organisms that take advantage of those little microclimates just created by the tree. Next slide. So what are the threats? Well, we all, we all know what the threats are. It's been, been uh, you know, pesticide use, imported disease, changing climate, habitat, habitat loss, and invasive species. Um, I'll, get, I'll say a word on imported disease. Remember I just mentioned the bees that were imported from Europe to uh, pollinate tomatoes in the hydroponic greenhouses? Well, some of those bees got out they had a disease and they have almost decimated certain species of our own native bumblebees. Next slide, please. This is a program, the Million, Nader, the Million Pollinator Garden Challenge is, uh, was put on by the National Pollinator Garden Network. It was formed in 2015. And the idea was to create million, a million pollinator gardens to help with this habitat loss. These gardens are strung all over the United States. So they started in 2015, in three years they'd met their goal. So now they're working on a new challenge. They're asking all of these gardeners to expand their gardens, maybe, and use three different types of uh, pollinator plants that, that bloom in the three different seasons that pollinators really active. That would be fall, summer and spring. Next slide. This is another resource that we've used, uh, that we use, got a lot of our information from. You can find both of these on the uh, web and we'll put up a slide at the end, I think that's gonna give a website address. Next slide. So this is the group that I'm part of. Um, I was lucky enough to convinced some master gardeners to help me with this. And then we uh, got to the uh, uh, ASU and we uh, enlisted a couple of folks up there to help us. 
So we call ourselves the Sonoran Desert Native Bees. We're a nonprofit Citizens for Science organization formed to study just native bees in the Sonoran Desert. The Sonoran Desert is the most biodiverse desert in the world. And there's a one square mile down around Tucson where there's over a thousand different species of native bees. So native bees are really important to this desert. In fact, many of the plants, especially the cactus and succulents have kind of co-evolved with the insects so that the, the cactus may have a specific bee that, that feeds on only that cactus. So they're very important. Well, these are our goals. We were, want to identify and document the species of native bees that are found here now. We need, want to determine about plants, habitats, and nesting materials they use. We want to see what we can do as citizens to support populations of native bees. And we want to engage people of all ages in observing and supporting bees and their habitats. Next slide. So we're really concerned with native bees, not honeybees, but their honeybees are so, so uh, there's so many of them around, we really need to differentiate between honeybees. So that's one of the things that we talk about. We've got a description on the left of bees as opposed to wasp or flies. And you guys can read that while I'm talking, but the thing about a honeybee, it's very specific. Um, it's light tan to dark brown, has that brown hair on the thorax. It has those flattened back legs with pollen baskets. And then the, the, the big kicker for me is when they fly between flowers, their legs dangle like little landing gear. And that's just a dead giveaway. You know that's a honeybee. So we try to identify, we try to get our, our Citizens for Science participants to understand that first, because we're, we are not interested in honeybees. We won't, they won't be part of the, the project. And if you were to take a picture of a honeybee on a plant and send it to us, it would just go in the trash because we're not interested. We're only interested in native bees. Next slide. So they come in all sizes, shapes, and colors. Um, and one of the references that reference books that we use is this this one bees in your backyard at the bottom left hand corner that's where this slide comes from uh, their native bees are mostly solitary they do not create hives they're they're uh, so they don't and they don't make honey they're more interested in pollen so they have no hive to protect so they generally don't sting they rarely attack and they're very efficient pollinators a single native bee will outwork an uh, individual honeybee four to one. In other words, it'll, it'll pollinate four times as many plants in a day as honeybees will. And they do this because they actually work harder and they work when it's, it's windy and there might be a little rain. They're out there working, whereas honeybees, they're taking the day off. Next slide. We have a, a secondary project that we're looking at. Uh, we're interested in seeing if native bees come to water. We know honeybees do, and I'm sure most of you have seen honeybees around a water source in your yard or around like your pool or something. But we're, uh, one of the secondary questions we want to answer is, do native bees need water sources also? Next slide. These are some of the things you, one of the, like a habitat that you can build in your house. We do have a website that we're going to send you to. And on that website, you can get the instructions for making these bee hotels. We found that uh, the bee hotels that you can buy commercially generally don't work. They're, they're just not set up properly. The holes have to be a specific diameter and a specific length. Native bees are able to pick the sex of their offspring. And if you make the holes too short, for example, all they're gonna produce are males and that's not gonna be good for the population. So if you do wanna create a bee hotel, go to our website or go to some of these other really good uh, reference books and make sure you're building it correctly. Next, next slide. One thing we do is, well, we used to do, 
prior COVID is community outreach. I'm sure we'll get back into it uh, one of these days, but one of the, the funnest exercises we do is we get with uh, schools and children and create seed balls. And you can see on the right-hand side, they've, they've got these, some of their seed balls finished. And these seed balls contain seeds specifically for bees. These are native plants that bees like. And, you know, the kids love to make these seed balls that get their hands muddy and have a great time. And then we tell them a little bit about the bees and how to plant these seed balls. Next slide. That's my slide. You're that, this is your last slide, Tom. That's it? Okay. That's it. I just wanted to interject here. I've helped out at the seed ball thing, and I have a picture of a little kid, muddy hands, sandwich in one hand, seed ball in the other. <laughs> I just <laughs> wanted to point that out. All right. Our next pollinator we're going to talk about, you, you all probably know a lot about this little guy. He's probably the most popular pollinator in the universe. Everybody loves hummingbirds. There's about 330 species of hummingbirds, but that number changes. <laughs> um, they aren't a very easy um, group of animals to study. They do uh, winter in the south and they fly north um, after that. So they do follow that migratory path that comes through Arizona. Some do not migrate though, um, but they are triggered, uh, is believed by food availability. So when they come up that migratory path, they're looking for sources of nectar and things like that, that they need, you know, for flight. And you probably know <clears throat> these guys need a lot of, uh, they expend a lot of energy. They fly by day um, when nectar sources such as flowers um, are more abundant. They also fly low um, and they look for flowers. You can see their season over here on the left. Um, we'll, see, we'll start seeing these guys pretty quick here. Um, as early as February, they'll be coming through and chances are the first ones through are gonna be male. So they're gonna start their migration north from their, from their overwintering places down south and they're gonna start their breeding up here. So um, it, it's, all, it's a pretty exciting season for these little guys. Um, they eat nectar, like I said, they also eat sap from trees and, and other plants that produce sap. They also eat aphids and small insects. And that's why they have a, you all know they have that long slender bill, but did you know that it's flexible? It's like they don't, they've got little jaws there that can expand pretty big and take in some insects and things like that. So that's pretty cool. Um, their north migration is for overwintering, like I said, but they come down here um, late summer early fall. And so we're actually seeing some of them uh, around here right now. I actually saw a little, uh, I think I saw either a very young, which I don't think is likely, um, hummingbird or one of those bumblebee. You know, I talked about the four species that we see here, but we get a lot of other different species too. And the smallest hummingbird species is that bumblebee. I think I saw one on one of my plants in my garden um, just a couple of weeks ago. So that's kind of cool. You probably know that they are the smallest known bird. They only get like three to five inches long. Uh, they have that long slender bill. But the thing that really, really makes these guys stand out is that the iridescent plumage. So most of them have this really cool iridescent plumage, their colors. Maybe you didn't know that though, that their vocal variations um, are, are pretty distinctive too. In fact, each species has its own language and the language is different between the male and the female and it signals different things. I don't know if you've ever heard um, a hummingbird defending its territory or whatnot, but they're very loud. <laughs> they, they can get very loud and they, they buzz around. Um, maybe you also didn't know that they can't walk. They actually lost, it kind of be, I guess, um, equal to us losing our thumb. They've got their three little toes in the front and they don't use them to walk, they hover, right? You've all seen them hover in, in midair. That's when they flap their wings really fast. In fact, it goes about 90 times per second when they're doing that. They can also fly backwards. They can shoot down about 40 feet in a second. So they're really, really fast. Um, everybody always asks me what their average lifespan is. And from what I've read, it's between six and 10 years. 
And I've actually witnessed tummy birds come back. I know kind of some behaviors of some hummers that I've seen come back to my property, the things that they like around my property and things like that. In fact, the little guy here on the picture, he got hurt and my husband walked over and picked him up. That's him, that's a little hummer sitting on my, my husband's finger. And later on he flew off so he knew he was okay, but he was hurt and we just gave him a little breather, put him in the shade, brought him in the shade and just kind of let him rest for a little bit. And then he was off. So that was kind of cool. Um, a lot of people want to know what their um, gestation and incubation period is. That's about 16 to 18 days. Um, their biggest threats are predators. They um, are eaten by things even like spiders. Large spiders will kill a hummingbird. Snakes, of course, and the larger birds, owls and bats are a threat. Their loss of habitat is huge. Um, we really have to pay attention to what we're doing, folks, or we're gonna lose our hummers. And then scarcity of floral resources. They depend on nectar. They, um, when they're migrating, they probably consume uh, three times their body weight. In, in nectar. So it's really important to them. Also, a lot of people don't realize, but we think of hummingbirds as always flying around and that's not true. They need roosting spaces too. They need to be able to perch and sit for a while and rest. And so that's really important to, to provide them. I think I mentioned Anna's hummingbird is a common resident. We have many other um, migrators that come through here. I mentioned, mentioned the bumblebee, the lucifer. If you're lucky enough to see a lucifer hummingbird, he is probably the most colorful I've ever seen. Um, Broad-tailed costas and calliope. And I think the little guy on the picture here is probably a female um, black-billed, but I'm not positive. The males and the females have different colors. As you probably know in nature, the women are a little bit, the women, <laughs> the females are a little <laughs> bit duller, but he's, this little guy still got the green iridescent on him and the, their wings are very, are typically a fawn or a, you know, they get into this area of kind of a grayish black. A lot of them, the red throated, of course, is just totally red. And they're in the family Trachylidea. I will show you, I will share with you Latin names of our animals and our plants we're going to be talking about. I won't always pronounce them. Elaine, if you're on the line, <laughs> I wish you were here in person to pronounce them for me, but I, I do have trouble, but I'll try. Okay, I'm going to give them to you and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, like I said, um, oh, they do fly by day. They're extremely sensitive to visual stimuli. In fact, they have an extra cone cell. Humans have three, hummingbirds have four. What does that mean? They can see more than we can. They can see more reflected light. We see as humans only what reflects light, right? Well, they can see more. That makes them very effective hunters, navigators, and things like that. They're heavy nectar feeders. Next up. Let's see my slideshow. This is a huge slideshow show because we got so many cool pictures from people submitted for this. It's very cool. Next up is the monarch butterfly. There's its Latin name. Um, this guy is uh, also extremely popular. We get some monarchs coming through their migratory path here. Not a whole lot. We're considered, I think Arizona is considered an intermittent or a Maybe actually their, their migratory path is called a fly, flyway. And so we have kind of like a secondary flyway for the monarchs, but we do see a, quite a few of them here. Most monarchs live in North America. They're, they of course are known by their tiger color coloration. And that's in fact a nickname for these guys, the tiger butterfly. Their migration season is um, to go from their um, south north for breeding is, is coming up pretty quick. They'll be hitting us in the spring, maybe late summer, and they um, fly north for their breeding. They fly south for their migration. They're overwintering in um, the summer or the fall. So you see these guys around mainly in the um, spring, summer, and fall. You won't see them a lot um, in the winter because they're extremely sensitive to cool temperatures. Even our, what we consider a mild winter, will kill a monarch. So that's very important to know. Um, individual monarchs have been known to fly the whole 2,500 miles of a migratory path. And that's mainly the guys that are going from their north south to overwinter that generation. But the generation that flies south north um, can, it 
often is broken up into two or even three generations because they come they come from the south to the north to breed. So they spend a lot of time mating and laying their eggs and things like that. And so you won't always see the same butterfly that comes down from the north to the south going from the south to the north. That's important to understand as well because their needs are different. When they come down for overwintering, they need roosting places, right? When they come up, they need breeding places. So <clears throat> that's important. And in fact, another nickname for the monarchs um, has gotten a, or another reputation actually, they're known to be smart, okay? Who thinks of an insect as smart? Well, this guy um, can actually fly three, four, five generations back to the exact same place in the exact same tree where their ancestor bred or their ancestor um, overwintered. So that's, it. that's kind of earned them a reputation of being smart. Not only their coloration distinguishes them, but their size, they're very large. And their antenna, their antenna are also, are also um, very long. And uh, they, the antenna serve a couple of different amazing um, functions for them. Not only do they, can the antenna, uh, antenna sense um, nectar, but it's also a compass. Their antenna can sense GPS, basically coordinates. So it's pretty amazing what these uh, little guys are made up of. When these guys are breeding, they'll lay thousands of eggs, thousands of them. So they need a lot of breeding place. In fact, if the female could, she laid, she would lay one egg per plant if she could, because she wants that plant, that little larva to be um, nurtured. And so that brings me to the, you know, like bees, um, they have four life stages. They go through the egg, the um, larva, the pupa, you know, and things like that. They go through those stages. Threats to these guys mainly is habitat loss. They're very, very delicate animals. And so they need a lot of protective spaces. Weather extremes is huge. They'll, they'll die, you know, they'll just die in the winter time. They, they can't be someplace cold. They also, they have the use of insecticide sprays and pesticides like Tom mentioned. In fact, um, germ warfare is a big threat to monarchs. Humans are so anti-caterpillar, it's ridiculous. We see a caterpillar, we wanna spray it, we wanna kill it, whatever. Don't, just don't do it. I go out in don't wanna destroy a caterpillar. I don't have a picture of a caterpillar in this presentation, but find a picture. And if you see one, leave it alone, right? Um, also the invasive species is big, um, has a big impact on these guys. And I'm gonna talk about that more, um, but basically invasive species aren't good for um, butterflies for a number of reasons. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. All right, why are we here? Tom, do you have anything to add to those two pollinators? No, I don't think so. You covered it nope. very well. Okay. So now on to the native plants. And this is why we're here. We're all about plants. But we called this presentation Pick Your Pollinator because we really wanted you to think about the needs of these animals and what the plants have to offer. So we're going to focus on a couple of native plant species. And so now here comes the interactive portion of this presentation. You all know what your chat room looks like, right? Your little chat board. Do you know how to turn it on? A couple of you have turned it on and you said hi. Hi. <laughs> hi to everybody that said hi. I appreciate it. So in your little chat uh, message, you can type a, a message in there and answer some questions that we're going to ask you along the way. So the first question is, why would we want to focus on native plant species that help these pollinators? And your answers don't have to be long at all. It can be one or two words. It doesn't have to be long. Just throw something out there. Let me see. Let me see some responses from you guys, especially my co-master gardeners. You guys that are out there, please. <laughs> Please throw something out there. Lots of good answers. We need some music. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Lots of good answer, you guys. I love it. To continue our flora and fauna, that's very good. Habitat's very good. Um, our plants need them. That's a very good answer. In fact, you guys hit yeah, native wildlife and pollinators need them. 
help the local pollinators. You guys basically hit it all. Adaptive, yes, there's adaptive plants out there. Um, Nate, I guess like the definition of a native plant, Tom, help me out. You wanna give a definition of a native versus well, an it's, adaptive? It's a, it's a plant that evolved in this area. I mean, whatever area you're talking about, it grew up in that area. Oftentimes, yeah. as you're saying, the, the pollinators co-evolved with the plants. And it's some of these relationships, when you read about them, it's just amazing. Yep. Yep. That's what I would say, Sue, too. The native plant has been here since dirt, right? They've been here. Yep. The adaptive plants have been brought in. And mean, and so we're not going to address those plants today as being beneficial to our pollinators, but some of them are. There's some that are beneficial. So we'll talk about that later. All right, you hit it all, you guys. I'm impressed. Um, the, the main reasons that I have down are that um, we want to focus on native plants because we want to, number one, keep our invasive species out of here. We want our native species to come in. The invasive species, and I'm not talking about the adaptive, but the, there's some invasive species out there like the buffalo grass. And how many of you had globe chamomile in your yard this year? Yeehaw. It, <laughs> yeah, it, those guys come in and they, they like take it over. So the more native plants you have in your yard or on your property, the better you're able to control those things. The other thing is, is our native plants are drought tolerant. They can take full sun and they're pest resistant. What gardener wouldn't love that, right, Tom? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So we're going to play a game with our plants. Um, we call it the plant knowledge card game. Um, it's kind of like flashcards. We're going to put up some information about plants, some drawings and pictures and things like that. And the purpose is to get you guys to look at the information and decipher for yourself what pollinator, pick your pollinator, what pollinator would like this plant and why? And why would they like it? It depends on the attractiveness of the plant and the usefulness of the plant to the pollinator, the native bee, the monarch, and the hummer. And you're gonna post your responses in your chat box. And again, short answers. What, who's your pollinator? B, what do they like about this plant? Blah, just spit it out, right? I wanna tell you two things about this, attractiveness and usefulness before we start talking about the plants. First is attractiveness, okay? Like I mentioned, these animals have the cones um, in their eyes, same as we do, they can see visible light, right? So they can see that whole electromagnetic magnetic, um, system that we can. They have receptors, right? Um, the second thing is the shape of the plant. It makes it um, attractive to them. And the shapes range from a tubular shape to a flat surface like is shown here and there's different shapes in between and configurations and we're going to show you some of those. This the shape um, has a lot to do with accessibility and the size also of the the head of the the flower makes a big difference to the different um, the different pollinators. <clears throat> so accessibility refers to the accessibility or how easy is it to get to the parts the reproductive parts and the different things in a plant. So the plant's usefulness, and Tom mentioned mutualism. So you all know what happens when plants with pollination, right? The pollen, the pollinator takes the pollen and spreads it around to other plants and blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna get into that. And I kept this drawing really simple for that reason. I don't wanna talk about eggs and all that stuff. I want you to, to recognize what's useful in the plants for these pollinators. You can see this stuff too. It's not like you need a microscope to see this stuff. You can actually see this stuff in your plant pretty much. So the first thing of course is the anther. That's at the top of the stamen here. That's where the pollen is. And the pollen gets carried by the pollinator up to the stigma. That's the female part. You all know that. So if these parts, the stamen and the stigma are accessible, it's attractive, okay? Some of our pollinators, well, our pollinators like that. They like accessibility like that. The other part to pay attention to is down here at the bottom. A lot of people don't know what these parts are. These parts are 
commonly down here in the bottom, not too close to the top, but in fact, the nectary where the liquid, the, the really sweet liquid, nectar is like a source of glucose and sugar and things for animal, for our pollinators. That production, that little gland, it's a little gland, typically down here around the receptacle at the bottom of all the little re reproductive parts in between the leaves. Some nectaries are on the stems and on the leaves, which is very interesting, isn't it? But um, the nectary is another big um, supportive part of the plant. So in terms of mutualism, the, the pollinator gets the pollen to feed their larva Typically, the pollinator gets the nectar, the plant gets reproduced. That's kind of the definition of mutualism. Do you want to say anything about that, Tom? No, I, I did learn that there were uh, three kinds of symbi symbiotic relationships and mutualism is one of them, where both, yep. both parties benefit from their relationship. Mm -hmm. All right, enough of that. Let's talk about the plants. <laughs> okay, so the knowledge cards that um, we're developing, Tom and I, um, there's a, we, we sh will show you a picture of the plant so you can see basically how it grows, where it grows, the name, the Latin name, and then its conditions, you know, what it grows, the conditions it grows under. So for the desert sunflower, this is a really, really cool plant, a very important plant in Arizona. Um, the, the Latin name is here. These are the conditions, and quite frankly, these are the conditions for almost all of our native plants. Right, Tom? Mm -hmm. Full sun, low water, around 20 yeah. degrees. Freezing is 32. Our, most of our guys can take it a little bit colder, but not all of them. So yeah, we'll talk about that. So I'm going to show you information about the plants, and then I'm going to ask you a question. So here's the first bit of information. The name of the plant, you can see kind of it's growing habit there where it's grown. It looks like he's in between a bunch of grass and things. He's pretty low to the ground. Not all sunflowers are though, I gotta tell you, they've got pretty long stalks, right, Tom? They're pretty yes. long. Yeah. yeah. So this little guy was just probably coming out. Okay, my slide, there we go. Don't go too far. I'm having to double click sometimes. So if I speed by something, <laughs> Stop me. All right, so the other side of the knowledge card is a close-up picture of the bloom and a drawing of the structure. And the sunflower typically has what we call a daisy-like structure. But the other important thing is that little structure, that flower is pretty small. It's only about an inch, inch and a half, pretty small. But what it has, the, it, it's like the workhorse of structures because it has what they call a composite head and every single one of those little pieces inside the center of that flower has its own reproductive parts so imagine not just one or two stamen not just one or two stigma but a lot of them in those little those little um, central flowers you can see the information there we want to tell you about each one of our plants the season the size the form the habitat blah 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 the season of these guys, pay special attention to this information because when we get done, we want you to tell you, we want you to tell us which pollinator would benefit and why. So this guy blooms in February and May. That's pretty much late winter, early summer, right? Um, dormancy, I have an NA there because I don't really think they go dormant. I don't know, they're, I guess they do. They're an annual wildflower. So, and they're actually a winter annual. So you see them more in the, um, in that February, May timeframe, but that's pretty much um, their, their form and their habit. They like to be in sandy, barren flat spaces. You'll see them along roadsides and up to 3000 feet. And when we talked about freezing temperatures, our freezing temperature here in the valley is 30, well, freezing temperature is 32 degrees. We don't typically get much colder than that, but we can above 3000 feet. You know, we do get colder than that. And you know what? You get above 3000 feet and you're gonna have a whole new group of plants that pollinators find attractive. So these guys that we're gonna talk about are specific down around our 3000, 1000 to 3000 foot level. Um, I wanted to give you propagation information because propagation is important to these guys. And these guys get seed heads in the fall. 
if you've ever gone out and collected seed heads, it's easy to do. You just wait till they turn brown, the flower turns brown, pluck them off, put them in your hand and throw them out. Pretty interesting. I wanted to give you the family name. These are in the aster family. What else is in the aster family? Does anybody know? You wanna put it in your, uh, in the chat? What other, what other flowers are in the aster family? Crickets, oh, there we go. Thistles, not, not milkweed, not thistles, no. Think daisy-like. Think fleabane maybe, I'm not familiar with that one. Blackfoot daisy, yep. Okay, so daisies, sunflowers, and guess what? The artichoke is in this family. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> And the zinnia, those are just some examples. Um, in fact, the dandelion, which many people consider a weed, is in this family. And what do those little seed heads look like? You guys know what those look like. But the dandelion is considered a weed by many people. We'll talk about that later, too. Also, you should know that compound flowering heads are high nectaring. What does that mean? A lot of nectar, right? Our pollinators are going to find a lot of nectar in these guys. Uh, so. Here's your main question. Pick your pollinator, bee, hummer, monarch, which would find this plant more attractive, most attractive and most useful and why? Just one word is good. Bees, correct? Anybody else? Yeah, the very yellow and open structure, that's right on. The monarch possibly could find this, this uh, plant very, very, very attractive. Landing pad, cool, I like that one. Landing pad, he's got the color, he's got the nutrients and things that probably those pollinators would like, mainly the, the monarch and the bee. Good job. Anything else, Tom? Oh, you wanted to add some things about care. Do you want to say anything well, about care? <laughs> unfortunately, I don't know much about this plant. I'm, I'm sure it's a wildflower, so you would probably want to plant it from seed. Yeah. But that's that's about all I know. Yeah, and I'll tell you what, I don't see many of these in the nursery, so transplants probably, yeah, seed is like the best, best way to go with these guys. Yeah. Okay, next plant, desert senna same conditions. I love these guys. I love these guys for a lot of reasons. They have a pea-like structure. What is a pea? Well, the pea family is huge. There's a lot of crop. There's a lot of plants that, that are in this uh, pea family. And mainly the pea family has multiple stamen. What does that mean? A lot of pollen. So this guy puts out a lot of pollen. The other thing, the petal arrangement is very significant and distinguishable, usually five petals. And they come in different kinds of configurations and shapes that we'll show you later. But the, this is a very important um, uh, family, the Fabaceae family in the desert. And we'll talk more about that when we get to our trees. Right, Tom? Right. <laughs> yeah, it is a perennial shrub. It's here in the winter through the spring. So think about that, you guys. It has a season that includes winter and spring. It goes a little bit dormant in the summer. There's a lot of these out right now. I live at the base of the Superstition Mountains and these sennas have been out for a couple of months now. They've, they're just going crazy. They're sprawling, they don't get very tall. But the really cool thing about this plant too is its leaves, the leaves kind of look like little fuzzy butterfly wings. They're very cool, has a very exotic look. I don't plant this in my garden, but I enjoy it out in the wild. Um, I don't see a lot of people uh, transplanting this either. You'll see this guy on the roadsides up to 2000 feet. So it probably won't be in the mountains, but it'll be um, elsewhere. Hummer, do you think would find this most attractive? Yeah, the bees for pollen, definitely. 
The yellow color is definitely attractive to some of our pollinators. Butterflies could potentially be attractive. Nobody said Hummer. Oh, somebody did. There's a question here that we should probably get back to. Somebody looked on iNaturalist. No observation were all from California, no Arizona ones. I don't, I'm not sure, Danielle, what that's referenced to, but we'll get back to that one. You might be talking about Hummers, I don't know. Oh, desert gold, okay. Oh, it's also a butterfly host plant, good. I didn't know that, that's very cool. All right, next plant. Oh, this one's very cool. Chuparosa, it's one of my favorites. Same conditions, you can see its form there. It's kind of a sprawling um, shrub and it has succulent stems. Uh, the flower structure is called tubular. That means most tubular structures, the reproductive parts are kind of tucked down in there. They're blooming right now, they're all over the place. I go hiking up in the superstitions, I see seas of these guys right now. They come up with the jojobas too. They like to come up through the jojobas and it's kind of funny looking because it looks like the jojoba is blooming red. <laughs> it's not, but it's kind of funny. It's, these are really, really fun, interesting plants. They, are, they can get pretty big, three to four feet. They bloom pretty much all year long. You'll have them in your garden pretty much all year long and um, they, you can find transplants. You can transplant at any time. They actually self seed and I learned this in doing research for this presentation. They have a mechanism that spits their seeds out. So that explains why when you see one chuparosa this season, we might see three next, right? Because they're spitting out those seeds and making sure that they uh, get spread. So I thought that was interesting. The other thing, um, this is our first red colored flower. There's probably something about this guy. He's in the Acanthacea family. That family is known for an nectar production. So he's, he's quite a little nectar producer. In fact, if you, want, if you went out and you picked one of these chuparosa flowers right now and you rubbed it between your fingers, your fingers would get sticky. So very interesting. And notice the little lipped form here. Bloom shape signify for one of our pollinators. Pick your pollinator. What does that little lipped? Hummers love this, okay. Hummingbird color and nectar, yep. The flowers are edible, I didn't know that. Got to be careful though, we don't, we don't endorse any, any claims that our plants are edible. We don't want to kill anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? What could that little lip signify to a, one of our animals, any of our animals? Be in the Hummer, definitely. A perch, a landing pad, good job. Oh, I see. <laughs> that they're ready to be pollinated, yeah. I like it. Access, <laughs> um, you cheated. <laughs> I know, <laughs> but they, they were gone the way. They were getting yeah, you wanna, you wanna say anything about the chuparosa? It's one of my favorite plants. It's, it is, a. I mean, chuparosa is Spanish for hummingbirds. So that should have been a dead giveaway on who likes this plant the best. We use it in landscapes a lot out here, so. Yeah, but we're just giving them hints right now. We're not yeah. telling them. <laughs> All right, next plant. This is a super iconic plant in Arizona. And this is where knowing the Latin names is very important and knowing the seasons is very important. This is the desert milkweed, uh, the acepal, okay, the subulata, okay? Just know subulata. That's a very important, um, uh, species of this plant that you need to remember, okay? And I'll tell you why in a minute. 
So very unusual structure. It's called the umbral. Um, and it's named that because it kind of looks like an umbrella. You know, when you spread out an umbrella, it's got the same little finger-like structures here. And tons and tons and tons of these little, almost looks like a tubular flower, but not really, it's not really tubular, but it's a very sturdy, almost waxy looking um, petal structure that, that go up and down. And inside each one of these little itty bitty structures are all the reproductive parts. So imagine, here's the real flower over here. You can kind of see how it's structured. All these reproductive parts in there. Very, very, very attractive, you would think. They get pretty big. They spread. Um, they're blooming spring and fall. They kind of go dormant in the winter. In fact, when their blooms, um, die, they have this come out. This is the pod of the milkweed. And those little black brown things in there are the seeds. And notice the seeds, it's almost like a dandelion, right? Those little seeds have wings and they spread. And this plant is so popular. If you have one of these, when you see the pods crack open like this, go grab it and spread those seeds around in your garden. The wind will carry them too. So you don't really have to do that. But I planted a bunch of these, Tom, over in the park this year. Oh, good for you. I seeded a bunch of these over there. So these little pods, they're very cool. I collect them and I collect them in brown paper bags. You don't want to collect them in plastic because that'll encourage moisture and mildew and maybe even disease. And so I put them in brown paper bags and then I attach them. I have a yardstick with uh, clothes clips on there. And I put this in a warm uh, or a cool uh, dry space, actually my pantry, <laughs> put them in my pantry. So that's part of propagation that you guys can get involved in. And we'll talk about that later. So what else about this plant, Tom? say too much about it <laughs> we'll nope. get the answers <laughs> okay okay what plant okay i'm seeing monarchs posted already oh somebody can't hear us turn up sound maybe i'm i'm all full yeah volume. i can hear fine yeah all right i'm sorry <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. You guys are, you, I see everybody posting monarchs. Oh, I wonder. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I know glitches happen. Um, okay. Aphids like this plant. Who said that? Cynthia. Very good. In fact, I, Tom and I will agree with you and say some people freak out when they see all the aphids on this plant. They do it no harm. Right, Tom? Right. Yeah, so don't worry about it. Um, there's another animal <laughs> that likes this plant that maybe we can talk about later, but it's kind of scary. <laughs> so everybody got oh, it. You're yeah. talk I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So this guy is really cool. He's also the sap is toxic to animals. So you got to kind of be careful with this guy. Although I don't know, Tom, how toxic is it? Is there? Well, I don't, I actually don't know how toxic, but I know that the toxicity is something that the monarch uses because this is a larva plant of food. It's a food plant for the monarch larva, which the monarch uh, larva is very white, yellow and black. It's very distinctive. And it becomes poisonous as it eats this poisonous plant. It doesn't hurt the, the uh, monarch larva, but because the larva now is poisonous, birds have learned not to eat a monarch larva because of that situation. And the, the monarch, <coughs> there's, there's many different kinds of milkweeds in, the, in, the, in that family all across up into Canada so that the monarchs will feed on all of those different uh, members of the family. Just depends on 
you know, some of the some of the uh, milkweed are very have very bright, beautiful blooms, and then some are like our desert varieties are pretty nondescript with gray foliage. But we have four or four, I believe, species of milkweed here in Arizona. They grow at different elevations. Yeah. And I will tell you, uh, since you guys all got this one right, somebody said Havelina though. I actually think this guy deters Havelina. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, this is a this is just the coolest plant. In fact, if you have no milkweed, you have no monarchs. Just remember that. But this is where, remember I said, knowing the species is very important. And look at the bloom time, spring to fall, dormant in the winter. Remember, what did I say about butterflies that they don't like? You can post it. Who wants to post that answer? Butterflies don't like what? They'll, it'll kill them. Our monarchs don't like it. Cold, exactly, you guys got it. They don't like the cold. So you won't see monarchs here in the winter at all. In fact, if you plant a plant that the monarch likes, like there's a species, a tropical species of milkweed that it likes. If you plant that and you keep the monarch here to feed and breed in that plant, the monarch will die. So you have to be careful about the species that you plant. I know they're pretty. They're very, very pretty, the, the tropical species of milkweed. It's got really cool orange red flowers. But if the monarch decides it's going to live there, it'll kill it. So that's why we say native, right? Native, native, native stay away from the others. All right, also I wanna point out that this family, the Apiacea family um, is, uh, carrots and parsley are also in this family, just so you know, okay? Good job, everybody. <laughs> right, Tom? Yep, thumbs up. <laughs> All right, here's another really popular one. I think when we do the BTA plant sale, this is probably the most requested plant. And here's where species is important to know too. If you come up to the plant sale and you say, I want a, a mallow, uh, you could say globe mallow, maybe, maybe that's a good enough indicator, but you need to know the species and same conditions. This guy grows pretty good along roadsides. It's a perennial shrub. Um, it's upright. It's main, main bloom time is spring, but you can see them in the summer and fall. Um, self seeds don't really need to seed this guy, but you can collect them if you want. Um, transplants. Yeah. They can be transplanted. Anything about care for these guys, Tom? You want to tell everybody? Well, you've got to treat them like a wildflower pretty much uh, here. You can, like you say, you can buy them in nurseries. And the, the color we're seeing here is just one of the many colors. But I've read that they don't breed true. So you might have one that's this color. And then, and then the seeds from it might be another color. And they're all in the pastel color. Uh, orangish, reddish, purplish range. Yep. Oh, and they, <laughs> the dust on this plant will irritate your eyes. So be careful if you're collecting seeds because it, it does uh, give you something, a, a feeling similar to pink eye. I've heard that, yeah. I'll put that in the notes for later. All right, the structure is important for our pollinators. It's got this nice, it's very small too. This bloom is pretty small, not more than an inch, inch and a half. And it's got this bowl-like structure that you see here. But look at all this stuff inside, all this stuff inside. There's a lot of stamen in there, a lot of stamen. It's got its receptacle. It's got little nectar producer glands down there. It's got all this stuff. So pick your pollinator. Which pollinator would like the globe mallow? Name it bees and butterflies and the color. Are the cultivars okay and are they as hardy? Can you answer that one, Tom? Cultivars. Well, I'm finding different uh, varieties. Varieties. Now, yeah. Maybe I would say the answer is yes. Okay, good. All right, what else? Yeah, I'm not sure about hummers. Definitely bees, probably butterflies. I'm not sure about hummers. If they would, you know, the delicate, the structure and the, you know, the size is important. The hummer might come up to this plant because it is tall and straight. What do you say, Tom? I, I don't know. I, I don't think it looks like a good hummer plant, but uh, yeah, I don't know. 
I thought they liked right. the tubular flowers more since they have that long they bill. But yep. they also eat insects. And there's going to yep. be a lot of different kinds of insects, not only just the bees and the butterflies, but I've seen little beetles and other things in there. So they might come for those. Yeah. I see our little native bees just practically like a baby curling up inside of these things. It's kind of cool. All right, here comes a stunner and a shocker. <laughs> this is a stunner and a shocker. This is another one of my favorite, uh, the fairy duster. And again, species is important. We're gonna talk about the Baja or the Caliandra californica, that, that breed, that red down there. I didn't have a suitable, what I thought suitable full plant to show you my my little Baja out in my garden right now has one flower on it so <laughs> I was kind of embarrassed to show you guys that one and that is its flower right there no I think that that was taken by the Lindholms the Lindholms took that picture these are by Bob and Barb Lindholm who I'll tell you about later but these are their pictures and it's a beautiful beautiful plant so many people love this plant including me it has kind of the same conditions. One thing I learned as I was going through this project, this presentation, I haven't seen a whole lot of these guys out there, Tom. How about you? Well, these are these are not really native to our area. The pink ones are you can find here in the superstitions. They're much lower. And I think you had a flower before, right? Of the pink yeah. one. Yeah, I had the pink so one earlier. These are in Southern Baja, California, and the red ones are the ones we use to plant because they're the the, the flower show is way more showy than, than okay. the pink one. They, All right, they, so the other thing I like about these guys is their winter bloom. Yeah. So they they bloom. They're great. They're a great Christmas plant because they're red and green. Yep. During the Christmas time. So there's so much to love about this guy. Can everybody hear me? Shelby, we okay? Okay. I have these new. <laughs> earbuds and I'm not I'm never sure about these guys new computer new earbuds <laughs> all right um so there's so many cool things about this plant the structure of course it, ha it has this spherical structure a fairly large receptacle back there that means lots of seeds and reproductive parts and the main reproductive part is the stamen so it's all those little spiky things you see there are actually stamen and so what does that mean? What does a lot of stamen mean, you guys? Can you answer that in the chat? A lot of stamen with anthers on the top. Lots of pollen, yep, pollen, pollen, pollen. Very good, everybody got it. And somebody says hummers do love it. I do see hummers feeding on this and maybe it's because there's a lot of um, nectar production going on there. I'm not sure what the correlation is between the number of stamen and nectar, but maybe this is a clue. If this guy is what they call a super nectarine plant, which it is, it's called a super nectarine plant, maybe the number of stamen has something to do with that, but I'm not sure. The, also, the beauty of this plant is something that's common with our plants here in the desert is its leaf formation. You can see it in the picture here. That's called a pinnate leaf, right, Tom? Uh -huh. A pinnate leaf structure. All that means is there's a lot of little leaves on one little stem side by side, just like it shows here. And that, that leaf structure gives a lot of our plants an exotic tropical look. And it's definitely apparent here with this plant. That's another thing that really, really, really um, appeals to people. The other shocker is this guy is in the pea family. Just like, what did we talk about before? The plant before in the pea family? The little senna, right? That little senna with those five perfect little petals. That's a common pea formation. This isn't so common, is it? It's not common at all. People don't think of this as being in the pea family, but it is. It's an amazing plant and people love it. So I think everybody got this, hummers like this. It's a big pollen producer. So of course, who else would like this? Bees, yep. Very good, Bonnie's got one of the natives. So I guess that's a pink one, yeah. Yep, they love the Baja for sure. That's for sure. Anything about care or anything else you wanna say, Tom? 
it's a, just a, a normal landscape plant that's you know desert adapted so it fits yeah. in well with our everything else in your yard yeah and so i ventured out from native here i should have done this on the pink one huh <laughs> pink one's the same except it's got pink flowers well this is native to the sonoran desert just not to this part of the sonoran desert okay then i'm safe you're safe <laughs> okay all right I call this guy the workhorse in the desert. This is our brittle bush. You probably see this around a lot. It's amazing. It's another one of those plants that basically we can't live without, right? It's got that central flower composite head structure. Uh, the flowers aren't that big. They're about an inch and a half, two inches. It's everywhere right now. It's, it's an amazing plant. If you look out on our foothills out here, it's a sea of yellow because of this plant. And that's kind of cool. So easy peasy guys, who does this appeal to? Bees, hummer, oh, okay, okay. bees, bees, exactly. I have so many pictures. I found, I, I have some video and some pictures for you, Tom, of one of your natives on this plant out in my oh, front cool. yard. Yeah, they're amazing bee attractors, amazing. And they're so important to the desert, they really are. So if you can get some brittle bush, I, I don't plant these in my garden because they self seed so easily, but um, they're amazing. All right, and they're in the aster family. Okay, I wanted to put up another, our sunflower is considered a wildflower. This guy is, a, is one of our most popular wildflowers, the blanket flower here in Arizona. If you were here a couple years ago, these guys were all over the place as were so many others. It's another one in the aster family. It's kind of short to the ground, but it's got that composite flower head again. It's a, um, an annual, so we, we hopefully we will see it back again this year uh, in the spring. And I don't know, is bloom time is April to, to September. Who's gonna love this plant? Pick your pollinator. <laughs> Bees. Yeah, I think mainly the bees and probably the butterflies, not so much the hummers. And I think that might be because it's so low to the ground, huh, Tom? It's a shorty, yeah. So that's just one of the many wildflowers. All right, we're gonna move on to trees now, Tom. Yay. Yay. So we have a lot of flowering trees in Arizona. Um, Tom and I picked these three because they're so prolific at this elevation. So we have our Palo Verde, the ironwood and the mesquite. And I picked the velvet mesquite for a reason. So first we're gonna talk about the flowers. Check this guy out, the Palo Verde. He's got that poppy, that pea-like structure. Why, Tom, what, what family is this guy in? Legumes. Legumes. Another legumes. Should yeah. we say why legumes are so say it. common out here in this desert? Well, first of all, our desert soil has very little nitrogen in it. Legumes are able to fix nitrogen by using with a symbiotic relationship between a bacteria that's on their roots. So these trees and all of these, I might as well let, let them know all three of these trees are legumes. And they have that bacteria, then they fix, they produce their own nitrogen. Yep. They're amazing. These flowers are beautiful. And we'll talk a little bit more about some other things about this, our trees, but definitely the flowers are an attractor. Um, what do you guys see around our Palo Verdes? And I put in the notes down there, kind of the three most popular varieties, the blue, the foothills, and the brea. I have all three on my property, but I think the foothills is the only one that was here before I got here because I planted my blue and my brea. And I like the brea, they're smaller and they get twisty. Yeah, mm -hmm. but they all have thorns too, so. <laughs> and then of course the, the, the um, green bark. So who wants to say loves this plant? Pick your pollinator, bees. Bees with an exclamation mark, <laughs> yeah. There's nothing, yeah. nothing better than sitting underneath one of these palo Birdie in the in the spring when they're blooming with a glass of wine and a book and just listening to the buzz. It's just yep. and and you're bathed in a golden light because of the all the yellow 
canopy above you, just it's just beautiful. Yeah, and this tree has that pinnate leaf structure as well, only they're so small. They are so small, but it's still, it, 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 mainly you look at this plant and you think it's all sticks, but it's not. It has those little pinnate leaves on it as well. And I saw somebody said it's known as, it's also known as Arizona snow. Yes, sir. Mm. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We'll talk about that. Oh, somebody wants to know, is there a good time of year to trim Apollo Verde, Tom? Well, I, now would be a pretty good time. I would not do it in the summer. And you want to be very careful about not taking too much of the upper canopy off because this uh, tree will sunburn really badly and, and, and you can actually kill it if you yeah. take too much off. I think a rule of thumb is never take more than a third of the branches. And here in the summer, you don't even want to do that. Yep. All right. Next up is our, oh, this is our, or ironwood. It has a pea-like structure as well, but notice the difference in the um, petal pattern. These guys kind of look like a um, snapdragon, kind of. They've got the folding down leaves, you know, the drooping leaves, and they've got all the uh, parts there exposed. Who would love this one? I see hummers. I think so too. Hummers, yep. Bees. Yeah, I think bees again, hummers. The other thing we should point out too, Tom, is the another indicator that it's a legume are, are the seed pods, right? The seed right. pods that these, these guys yeah. all produce. They're pretty impressive. And I, I didn't do, mention it, but the, the Palo Verde seed pods are edible. The, the peas are edible. Um, but you didn't I've hear heard, that here. <laughs> I've heard the ironwoods. Oh, am I not supposed to say that? No, it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. And I didn't mention it either, but the Senna and um, some of the other flowers that we talked about, they put out pods too. You know, I, yeah. I think I did mention it. Yes. Sea pods. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. Here comes a shocker. Check <laughs> that guy out. That's the velvet mesquite. Again, notice the pinnate leaves, but look at this flower. I did not draw the structure for this flower because I have not figured it out yet. All that I've read about it is that it's kind of a flat, maybe a flat daisy-like structure, but how many of them are there on there, do you think? Can you take a guesstimate? Is there a few or is there a lot? Post it in the chat. <laughs> Tons, yep. So what does that mean? There's a ton of little reproductive parts on this one flower. In fact, there's so many reproductive parts and nectar producing parts on this one flower. It's been tested to be 25% sugar. Okay, who likes this plant? Pick your pollinator. Who would love this plant? Yep, bees, bees. Yeah, I don't know about hummers. Tom, what do you think? Did the hummers come up to this guy? I don't know. Again, I don't. <laughs> yeah, me too. You know, doing this project, I got to become more observant too. I have one of these on my property right next to my jacuzzi. So I got to check that guy out this year. Pay more attention. The other thing I have up here, the form, it's a, our, a lot of our trees are multi-trunk and that's significant too, to our, uh, our pollinators. All right, I'm gonna divert real quick to our succulents. Probably the, the two most flowering succulents we have are the Apuntia and the Hedgehog. And I didn't put anything in here about the flower structure, but who, who likes these guys? Any guesses? Who likes bees? They've got a lot of those little stamen in there. You can see it from here. Hummers do too. Yep, pretty sure. Uh, you know, the cactus flower is an open book, an open story. And I think a lot of people believe that too. And they're so beautiful. They're so delicate. They're so papery. There's, there's just so many things about them to love. And we have more here than any place else. All right, here's the big reveal. You all did so good answering the questions. You were so brilliant. I was so impressed. So now let's summarize. 
Um, plants attractiveness, you all got it. That visible light factor for the Hummer is in that red um, area. And the most of the tubular plants that we have here are in that red color area. If I were gonna do this exercise face-to-face -face, or when I do this exercise face-to-face, -face, we hand these slides out in like little quarter size and we have people read them and then we say okay everybody with the red flower go to this side of the room everybody with the yellow flower go to this side of the room which side of the room has more people standing there you can answer in your chat the yellow side or the red side who would have more red yep yellow oh we're getting mixed answers Okay, mostly yellow, you answered. Some of you said red. Um, I don't know, Tom, what do you say? What would you oh, say? Yeah, definitely yellow. I have clients that complain that all the flowers out here are either red or yellow. There's hardly any blues. Yep, hardly any blues. So you might imagine the hummers are very, 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 in fact, some of our pollinators are generalists and some of them are specialists. The hummers, I would classify as a specialist in that they seek that color out probably more than anybody else. And they seek that tubular shape out probably more than anybody else. And kind of same with the bee, they seek out the yellow and they seek out the flat landing pad. And then the butterflies all over the place, but for different reasons, they might seek out the milkweed down here in the creamy yellow color and then for the pollen and for laying their eggs, but for nectar and other things, they're all over the place. They'll seek out anything. So they're more probably a generalist, wouldn't you say, Tom? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of important to know. Um, and then this cooperative evaluation, you got to ask yourself which came first, the pollinator's preference for that color or that shape, or do the flowers signify something to them? You know, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg question. Which do you think came first, the flower and the color or the pollinator, you know? So that's what cooperative evalu evolution is. It's basically, they probably develop together. Right, Tom? Uh, yeah, and I, I don't understand the mechanism. I'm definitely not a... Yeah, I'm not an expert in this either. All we can use is our eyeballs right, our observations, and we can learn these things. Um, definitely the red and the yellow signify something to our pollinators and the shape. So shape plus color is what you have to think about when you're planning to help our, our pollinators. Almost done. All right, last thing, you know, we talk about usefulness. We talked about the flowering parts of the plants a lot, but we didn't talk about trunks and things like that. A lot of our, of our trees, especially the mesquite and the ironwood, they've got all of these little nooks and crannies in them that who, who can make homes in here? Who do you think makes a home in all these little nooks and crannies? You can post it in the chat. Yeah, it's mainly our native bees. Um, the butterflies love to roost in our trees. In fact, the multi-trunk structure and the density and the thorns and everything, like you can see over here in this nest. I'm not sure this is a hummer nest. It's in one of my Palo Verdes. It was about the size, it is about the size of my fist. That's a little large for a hummer, but look at that sucker. All those thorns and all those branches around there, who's gonna mess with that bird? <laughs> who's gonna mess with those babies? Nobody. So our pollinators have a lot of places. If we give them these trees, they've got a lot of places to nest and roost. And then back to the milkweed here and the, the monarch, all those, little, that, all those little fingers, umbrella structures that come up through that plant, the, the eggs have a nice little place to sit in there, right? And the butterfly, in fact, the monarch lays thousands of eggs. And if she could, she'd lay one per flower. You know, but she she lays those eggs in there and, and uh, they're they're well protected. The other thing I want to talk about, somebody said Arizona snow. Our trees have a lot of litter. They not only have the flower and the and the little leaves and the pods, they also have the pods and things like that. And all those things are 
or to help our ground, like Tom was saying, it fertilizes the ground and it offers this mulch. We tend to rake those things away. I don't do that anymore. I don't rake it all away. In fact, I learned this at the BTA. I was taking care of one of the gardens for a while and they, the, it wasn't Preston, but it was somebody else came up and they said, oh, don't, 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 don't rake all of that away because all of that stuff is so important for the plant and all the other different animals that, that live down there. You want to leave some of that. So I only rake like outside of the, the um, trees branches, right? I'll rake around where places where I sit and, and things like that, but I don't rake right under my trees anymore. So that's just um, one thing. Okay. All right, what else do our pollinators need? Guess? Anybody want to post it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you can put in maybe a cool little water source. This is a little, I think an inch and a half copper tubing water feature I have in my garden. And I have a video of this guy diving inside of that tube. <laughs> no joke. So you want to give your hummers and your pollinators some water. It's really easy to do if you can. And then feeders are fine. You know, if you want to put out a feeder or a little um, nesting or, or um, breeding house like uh, Tom showed you for the bees, do it. But, you know, main thing is, is to think native, you know, and you got to remember that their survival depends on us. We have to be observant. We have to watch what's around us. I mean, an ecosystem is nothing more than the living and the structures and the things around us. If you pay attention to, you know, even, you know, putting out, um, putting up a, a structure in your garden could either encourage or deter a pollinator. So you wanna think about things that you're doing. I try to put things around in my pollinator garden that will protect from wind and different things like that. Think about what you're doing to um, support their habitats and the ecosystem. And then a big one is learning sustainable agriculture practices. And that's what the master gardeners are all about. Think native, we've talked about that a lot. Collect seeds, learn how to propagate. We, um, the BTA is a good place to learn things like that. If you go to a class or a speech up there, go do it. Uh, we talked about integrated pest management. Tom, you wanna talk about that a little bit more? Sure. Let me just answer a gal's question there. The uh, IPM or integrated pest management started in the 70s when we were all getting pretty tired of what the chemicals were doing to our foods and lands and our bodies. So integrated, integrated pest management basically says start with the least harmful thing you can do and work your way towards chemicals. So if you have weeds in your yard, the least harmful thing you can do is just go out there and pull them. But sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you've got to do other things, but then you pick the, the chemical that's going to have the, the, the effect on the plant or the, or the weed or whatever your problem is with the least amount of harm to the environment. And I think one of the biggest threats that I didn't mention is just our own apathy towards these threats, but I, I see that changing. I, I'm encouraged that you get something like a million or million pollinator garden challenge and they meet their goal in three years. I think that's a very viable way to help replace habitat. You're creating these little pods of native plants and even non-native plants that will help the pollinators and it, it's going to give them uh, habitat that they didn't have before. And if enough people do that, we can maybe mitigate some of the damage we've done with our, uh, you know, large farm farming practices and intense use of fertilizers and chemicals. Very cool. Yep. So that's important. And I have the, I have pests and weeds in quotes here because as a master gardener, we get a lot of training from the um, U of A um, extension program. And Rick Gibson has been our mentor and our trainer for years and years and years. And he throws these little things out there at you that you can never forget. And one of the things he told us early on was the definition of a weed. What do you think it is? What's the definition of a weed? We've got a lot of master gardeners out there that should know that. 
<laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll give it. I'll give you Rick. It's a Rickism. Okay, a weed is a plant anywhere that you don't want it. So you can kind of apply that to pests too. A pest is a pest. <laughs> <laughs> if it, or an insect is a pest if it's somewhere where you don't want it. But we have to do like what Tom said, we have to avoid treating them with chemicals and be in rushing, you know, to eliminate them because uh, we got to take care of our environment. And so this is all, I don't use any pest management. I use a water hose to hose off the aphids and the white flies. That's about my extent of pest management. Um, and I pull my weeds, you know, um, support and join your projects and experts that you know are good. Citizen science was mentioned. And number one, become a master gardener. It'd be really cool to have you. Um, membership and how to get involved. I don't know, I think the classes, the next class we're gonna do, we go through a whole semester long class. It's pretty intense. And the uh, U of A teaches it. They send their, their pros down and they teach it. And we hold our classes down at Central Arizona College. Um, I think the next class is coming up won't be until <clears throat> 2022. But if you want to know for sure, get on Carol's email list. And I'll leave this slide up there. You guys take a picture of it. I can post these uh, in the chat too. Maybe hang on for a minute, Shelby, and let me do that at the end. Um, other information, the um, Arizona Extension Master Gardener website. You can find out about all of us, most of us there anyway. Um, the different uh, chapters and stuff are there and the information about the program and getting involved. And then more about pollinators. These are sources that um, Tom spoke of here. This last one down here is where you can get that booklet that Tom showed the cover of. It's got a lot of good information in it. And then finally about this presentation, um, it was put together by Superstition Mountain Master Gardeners. I listed their names here. Tom as well put the B presentation or his uh, B group put that together. We'd really appreciate it if you did. I mean, this is being recorded. If you use this presentation, um, reference us. You can reference us as SMMGers. We would really appreciate it. And I think, I think Barb and Bob and Elaine and everybody that sent me pictures and helped with this, I really appreciate it. And then the last thing is, is when you're giving information or seeking information about our pollinators and our plants, use trusted sources. There's a lot of bloggers out there. You know? It's like you can, you can find different information out there, but use trusted sources. So I listed a couple here and um, maybe that'll be helpful to you. And that's it. Awesome, thank you, Kim. We had two questions in the Q&A section. Okay. What are they? We have, are there certain trees that hummingbirds prefer to nest in? I'd say the Palo Verde. I think I've, I've always seen them in trees that are really dense where there's, yeah. you know, they're not out in the open so much. There's some branches. In my fist, so. And the other question about the monarchs, the monarchs like all milkweeds or just certain types. In my opinion, they like all milkweeds. Now that's yeah. my opinion. I, I'm not gonna base that. I, I haven't done a study on that, but as I was saying before, the uh, Asclepius family is pretty widespread over this continent, but it, uh, sometimes the plants have no resemblance to one another, the species don't. So, but they're still milkweeds. They still have that poisonous sap. And avoid the, for the monarch's sake, avoid the winter bloomers. What else? Those are all the questions we have in there. Are there any other questions? You can leave them in the chat or in the Q&A. Somebody said they've seen hummers nesting in a ficus. Actually, I have too. In fact, yeah. one was a hummer was nesting right outside uh, an office window. I brought, the mom disappeared. I brought the little fledglings home and I raised them in my shower at home. I closed off a glass wall and I raised them in there. And then when they got old enough, I took them outside and they flew away. I actually oh, raised cool. some hummingbirds. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Kim and Tom for this really informative, great presentation. I know I learned a lot. Um, and Very thank cool. you everyone who tuned in for the presentation. We appreciate you uh, joining in. Yeah. Let me put these URLs in the chat so people can copy and paste them. Is that okay? Or sure thing. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay, hang on, everybody. I'll get them in there. 
So I'm going to copy this whole slide. Well, not the whole thing, just the URLs. Then you guys can copy and paste them or you can take a picture of this slide. <laughs> and this recording will be posted on our YouTube channel too. So you'll be able to see those links there as well. Okay. Go ahead and grab those URLs, you guys. And thank you so much. Thank you all you master gardeners who attended. We love you and we appreciate you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Tom. As soon as I figure out how to get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Leave meeting. Stop.